thank you so much. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Lovely. Welcome. Uh, Avino, I have spent the last few days immersed in a deeply magical world of folklore, myth, and oral traditions. In Avino's very, very accomplished novel, Where the Cobble Path Leads, there's the human world, the non-human world, an in-between world, a world of spirits, a world of plant spirits, and a world of animal spirits. In the beginning, when I started reading the novel, I thought, oh, this is an Enid Blyton novel based in Nagaland. But to slot it that way is to diminish the many, many strengths of the book, to diminish the considerable scope of the book. This is unlike any book I have read. This book about a little girl negotiating her way after her mother's death is quirky, audacious, and kept me turning the pages. Avinio, congratulations on your third book. It's an absolute pleasure to be in conversation with you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Prachwal, and thank you for the very kind words and the close engagement with uh, the story. I really appreciate that. Wonderful. Let's start from the beginning, Avinio. How, how did this book come about? Well, um, Many things, actually. Um, it was uh, inspired by, uh, I'm a Naga, and we Nagas, we come from a, uh, we are a very highly oral indigenous society, and our heritage is mostly intangible um, in the form of oral narratives. So uh, I grew up with folk tales, uh, listening to stories, um, uh, folk tales and legends. So these were I always found this um, very inspirational, and uh, they're a source of identity. And then um, I think also my fascination with how you know marvelously strange this world is, and especially a lot of um, uh, a lot of the chapters, uh, groundwork was written during the pandemic as well, where many of us we suffered losses of loved ones and uh, it made me think a lot about death and the afterlife and uh, so this story is also one about um, grief and also um, surviving and embracing grief and also my fascination with um, uh, what academics call nativized Christianity um, and all this came together uh, into um, and came together, and uh, that was how it began, where the cobble pot leads. Great. Uh, I would love for the audience to get a little taste of what the book is all about. Do you mind reading a short extract? Oh, of course. Um, so this book, well, it's defined as a um, folk fantasy novel. Uh, combining fantasy fiction and um, spirit stories, Naga spirit stories. And also it's a book about, as I said, uh, it's about grief and embracing and surviving grief. And the protagonist is a young girl, Vime, 11-year-old girl who is struggling to come to terms with the demise of her mother. And um, it also, I mean, that was my intent to trace her spiritual education um, through a fantastical, adventure or misadventure, uh, and how true that she comes to terms with, um, learns to accept pain and loss. And um, the extract that I'm reading is um, the part, uh, one of the final chapters where Vime is stuck in this spirit world, and, um, and, and, and she goes to sleep, and then she dreams a deep dream. And um, so it goes this way. Vime dreamt of the night and being back on her beloved cobbled footpath. The world had gone to sleep. All was calm. Guiding and lighting her path were tiny fireflies fluttering luminous against the canvas of dark night. Dead souls on their way to the afterlife. Vime thought, remembering an old, much-loved song. 
All fatigue had vanished, and Vi Mei felt very much alert. She was awake in a dream. And Vi Mei knew she really was dreaming when she saw Mother. Mother looked different, ethereal, her body radiating incandescent light from within. Not younger like in the in-between, not older either, but like she was finally resting in her true form. But when Mother spoke, her voice sounded exactly like the way we may remember it, early, jovial. I must remember to tell Nime this, that people sound exactly like themselves in the afterlife, thought Vime. Mother smiled as if she knew what Vime was thinking. They walked together side by side. After waking, Vime would not remember all they spoke of, but she would remember telling mother how beautiful she looked. Afo, so much has happened after you left. Nime is in college now. I know, Vime, I know. Father remarried. Yes, I know. Mother smiled kindly. Is she nice? She's very nice, Vime thought. She thought she'd feel guilty saying this, but she didn't. She knew mother understood. And you, how are you? Mother asked, her eyes shining bright with boundless, limitless love. I wasn't okay for a long time, but I'm going to be all right now. Vime felt happy and sad too as she spoke her heart. That's my brave, clever girl. I'm so proud of you. Oh, Afo, I miss you. I've missed you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Avinia. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you chose that extract because when I was reading this eminently readable book, it almost felt as though my grandmother was whispering a story into my ear and we were seated around a fire. There was this very, very strong oral component to the book. It, it felt as though I was listening in on a conversation or listening to someone tell a story. Could you tell a bit about if that was your intention with the book? Oh, I'm Prashwal, I'm so happy you said that because that's actually the highest compliment for me, a uh, 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 Naga indigenous writer. So um, I keep repeating this, but we have an oral history and our um, stories were passed on through the medium of um, speech, orality, but with changing lifestyles and thought patterns. Um, uh, in time, script came to replace orality. Um, and uh, I don't know whether I succeeded, but what I'm, uh, when have, I write... You have, Thank yeah. you, yeah. So when I'm writing, I'm also trying to um, I try not to focus too much on the technicalities of writing because I think I would go wrong that way if I'm concentrating so much in the medium of storytelling rather than the, the story itself. But I'm also, I also try to incorporate orality and imagine how this story could be narrated orally. So I try to um, infuse a lot of my uh, local words um, making it a point not that they are not italicized because I want it to blend into the overall nar narration and not become conspicuous it leaks. And then uh, I try to imagine an oral st uh, a storyteller when they narrate a story. Often there are digressions, there are re uh, words are repeated often. It's not perfect. So I'm trying to imitate speech and in a way trying to um, see if um, script can aid the cause of preserving the oral tradition and oral storytelling as well, and uh, how each can necessitate the other. I don't know whether that makes sense, but yeah. It, it makes perfect sense. I, uh, so the novel is based in the Indian state of Nagaland, which is a predominantly Christian state. In fact, uh, I know that Nagaland has the highest population of Southern Baptists in the world outside of America, right? And uh, your book is very, very heavy on Christian elements, 
But this isn't really the Christianity that was proselytized by uh, the missionaries. It is the, the Christianity of your characters like Vime and her stepmom is a Christianity that blends Naga cosmology and culture very harm harmoniously with uh, whatever was proselytized. Could you, you know, you've mentioned in an interview in Platform Magazine, I think, about your fascination with nativized Christianity. Could you talk a bit about that? Oh, you're very astute, Prachwal. So, um, yeah, nativized Christianity is something that a lot of academics have uh, spoken about, and uh, um, Naga writer, um, incidentally, my aunt, Ishtarine Kire, has also spoken about it often. And um, the thing is, for Nagas, it's like Prachwal has um, very rightly said here, predominantly, predominantly Christian society. And uh, it came about, um, uh, Christianity came to us during the 1800s, during the 1830s, and the missionaries who came were the Puritan category, um, very Southern American missionaries, and they were quite um, orthodox, and this is something that even contemporary Naga, a lot of Naga clergy subscribe to, where they, um, where we have to shut the door to anything to do with Naga cosmology, that Christianity means to shut out the spirit world. But um, what is interesting in, is that for a lot of Naga people, and especially in the villages, we are Christians, but at the same time we have we also keep the door open to the spirit world, the um, indigenous religion, and how um, it's not about turning differences into similarities, but how both can coexist. So we call it a nativized form of Christianity. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we, we have about 10 minutes left, but I know there are a few uh, writers in the audience who are extremely curious about your writing rituals, your process. I uh, was struck by a degree of effortlessness of writing in the book, and as a writer, I know that nothing, nothing comes easy. But I, I would love to know, you're a teacher, you, you uh, are an English professor at a university in Kohima. College. Oh, college, yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you juggle teaching with writing? Do you write every day? Tell us a bit about all that. I think you would be able to answer this much better, I mean, in a much more helpful way, Prachwal, being the fine writer that you are. I, um, honestly, I, I don't have any process as such. I don't write every day. I think the luxury of having a daytime job is that one can be very indulgent when it comes to writing and um, write only when you know, you, inspiration really strikes. So I'm quite an indulgent writer in that way, and um, I really have no writing process. It's just very boring, actually. It's just writing and writing, redrafting, editing, and more writing, so uh, nothing glamorous, I think. I don't know whether you would agree, but... I, I do. I mean, all those of you who think writing yeah. is glamorous, we get invited to the Jeppo Literature Festival and party every night. You don't know about the, the solitariness of... of of just sitting in front of your laptop and typing away, but carry on. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. The, f the first bit, when you're actually writing the story, I quite enjoy that. It's very um, cathartic sometimes, uh, often um, very pleasurable, but after that it becomes very tedious, you know, rewriting, uh, redrafting, and, I mean, just throwing everything away and starting all over again. But I do believe in um, something called um, writers, other writers have described as a big creativity period. I do believe in that, and uh, somehow I feel like I enjoy writing best during um, certain hours of the day, like between three to six. But I think that, o that is only um, makes sense where I come from, a small town, where that's when the day is slow, you know, the sun is going down, people are coming back from work, and everything is just slow and a lot more beautiful. So I, I, I like writing during that time. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Avinio. I think uh, we need to open the floor for questions now. Yeah. Uh, if anyone has questions, uh, please raise your hand and someone will come to you with a mic. Uh, 
Yes, yes, let's look it up. Hi, thanks for coming here. Uh, so I have a question. Even in fiction, you know, quite a lot of people say that they are from reality or there is a touch of reality when you write fiction. So one, I don't know, is it true or not? Is it true? And does it happen with you also? Though it's a fiction uh, book, I haven't read it. I will pick it up this time. But do you think it has a, some kind of reality or some story that you pick from real and turn it into a fiction then? Um, I. Uh I think so, yes. For me, I, actually, I, my, most of my fiction writing stems from something personal. And, uh, and I'm using the term personal very loosely here as well. But uh, yes, it does stem from something personal. And um, I think, um, I don't know whether Prachwa will agree, but um, for me, it's quite important that fiction is rooted in something real, something that is essentially nonfiction. And yeah, and, and like we say, literature reflects life. So I think the two are, I mean, the two sides of the same coin. Does that answer your question? We have time for one last question. Two questions. OK, there's someone out there? Yeah. My name is Kunal. Sorry. We can't hear you. Could you hold the mic closer? Hello. Am I audible now? Yeah. So I just wanted to ask you, like I have heard about it being a defense as friend. I have heard about the the courage and the valor of the Nagas. I just wanted to know, like, uh, what is the reason behind it? Is there any specific reason that the Nagas have gone through in their past life? The courage and the valor of the Nagas. I just wanted to know. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat your question? Yeah. yeah. Since I've uh, I have read about the Nagas culture, they are more, they are brave and the fighting. Uh, they have a you know like a homogeneous fighting spirit. So I just wanted to know what was the reason behind this. Like, is there any history letter? Letter to with them, which makes them like that. Yeah. The uh, bravery of Nagas um, is. I don't know whether I can um, answer your question adequately, but um, a very a deep awareness of uh, spirit activity has always formed the basis of uh, Naga life and the spirit world and the physical human world. They. Um, often coexist, collide, merge as one. And um, yeah, so that has always been um, uh, a way of life for us. I mean, so yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah, Gloria? I wonder what the reaction in Nagaland has been to your novel, and particularly in terms of um, how people have thought about you taking oral traditions and writing them down. Um, people have um, been very kind, actually, and very encouraging. And uh, yeah, it's uh, all been, like I said, just very kind, very positive. And, um, it has been very educative for me as well. A lot of elders, sometimes they come to me and they say that what you wrote there, you know, there's actually a, a larger story to that. And then they, they come and tell me. And um, a lot of elders, I mean, um, they encourage me to write more and actually um, tell me to write more nonfiction, actually, yeah, to, uh, in, by way of documenting our uh, stories. So, yeah, it's just been very positive. I was a bit nervous about the uh, Christian element, but somehow, yeah, so far it's been good. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Avinyo. Thank you. This was a lovely audience. Uh, we are out of time, but Avinyo will be available to sign copies of her book Oh, and other books that she has written. So I'm sure you can take your questions to her. Thank you. This is uh, Where the Cobble Pot Leads. It is available at the bookstore here. Do buy a copy and, and get it signed by Avinyo. You'll be all the richer for it. Thank you, Avinyo. Thank you so much, Prashwal. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>